Good afternoon. My name is Suzanne Spaulding, and I am the Senior Advisor for Homeland Security and Director of the Defending Democratic Institutions Project here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Today, we're excited to host a terrific discussion looking at the important role that civics can play in promoting civil discourse in the workplace. Today marks the first day of National Week of Conversation. Organizations all around the country are hosting programs and workshops to simply get Americans talking again, encouraging opportunities for Americans to converse together with mutual respect and civility, regardless of differences. It is in celebration of this larger effort and in support of our larger civics work here at CSIS that we are so excited to host today's program. It's essential that workplaces both create and promote opportunities for their employees to practice civil discourse, and civics can play a key role in developing those civil discourse skills. Before introducing our speakers today, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsors of our ongoing civics work, the Aboda Foundation, Craig Newmark Philanthropies, Microsoft, and the Southern Company. They have all been invaluable partners in this effort, and we are incredibly grateful for their support. And one last note before I turn things over to our speakers, you'll see an Ask Questions Live button listed on our events page. We will take some audience questions toward the end of the program. So if at any point during the discussion you want to ask our panelists anything, please fill in the question form. Now, it is my distinct honor to introduce Deborah Enix Ross, who will deliver some opening remarks today. Deborah currently serves as the president of the American Bar Association. She's also a senior advisor to the International Dispute Resolution Group at Deborah Voice in Plimpton. In her role as ABA president, Deborah has been a strong advocate for the promotion of civics and civility. She has made it the signature issue for her term as ABA president. And I have had the honor of working closely with her on the ABA's Cornerstones of Democracy, Civics, Civility and Collaboration Commission. Over the years, she served in a number of other roles at the ABA and at the International Bar Association, including Chair of the ABA Center for Human Rights and Chair of the ABA International Law Section. We are so thrilled and honored that she has taken time from her very busy schedule to join us for this important discussion. Over to you, Deborah. Thank you, Suzanne, for that really good introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me because I, I did try to unmute. That's the rule number one still with, with the, all of these virtual meetings is to unmute yourself. Um, that is, it was just a very generous uh, introduction and uh, it, it is so typical of, of you and the way that you conduct uh, your meetings and conduct your work. And so it was, it's a real honor to be here. Um, I do feel a bit like that movie, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, maybe without the Oscar, but uh, it, it was really important for me to be here because as you've indicated, as president of the ABA, I have been focused on what I call the three C's, civics, civility, and collaboration. These are what we call the cornerstones of democracy, and you are serving on that commission, which has done tremendous work, uh, and I'm really very proud of the way that the three C's have been taken up, not just within the legal profession, but across professions. That's the collaboration piece that we talk about, why it's so important for us to promote civics and civic education and civic engagement and to promote civility uh, so that we can have difficult conversations, but do it in a way that is productive uh, and that leads to a more just, equitable, secure society. So the, the, the fact that we are focused now on civility at work uh, is, is extremely important. Uh, and so I do thank you for this work and, and recognize that this is an ongoing conversation 
uh, and that it's important that we maintain these conversations uh, and have this focus in the ABA. ABA. Uh, Law Day this year is May 1st, and it will be the Law Day will be these the cornerstones of, of democracy, this whole civics, civility, and collaboration again uh, as part of our work. Uh, and it will be, for me, uh, uh, I hope, a legacy of promoting civics educa education, promoting civic engagement, promoting civility, and promoting working across professions so that we can all uh, do our part to, to create this, the, the more just society that we would like. I'm going to stay with you as long as I can, uh, but I want to thank all of you in advance, your speakers in advance, for the work that you're doing. Thank you for your collaboration with the American Bar Association. Uh, and I could not leave being ABA president without saying thank you to our members and to those of you who are not ABA members. I would encourage you to join us so that we can join in doing this great work together. Thank you all very much. Deborah, thank you so much for those inspiring comments uh, and mostly for the for the great work that you're doing, the passion that you bring to these issues and for for really making this uh, your signature issue. Um, and I'm very grateful that you're willing to stay with us as long as you can till you get pulled into another meeting. So thank you for that, uh, for being willing to join the conversation with our illustrious panelists who have as I said, been such strong allies and, and leaders really in advancing civics and related competencies. So um, we have uh, we are joined today by Jenny Badenas, uh, Senior Director of Microsoft's Democracy Forward Initiative. That initiative focuses on addressing ongoing challenges to the stability of democracies globally. The initiative also includes Microsoft's journalism programs, which focus on, among other things, countering disinformation and increasing media literacy. Prior to joining Microsoft in 2014, Ginny was Vice President of Political Services at CMDI. And in 2021, Ginny was listed as one of Washington Magazine's, quote, most influential people in national security and defense. Uh, and I can attest to that. She is definitely, she is also everywhere, uh, you know, all at once. And she is part of the planning group, I'm proud to say, for our civics initiative. Ginny, thank you so much. We are also joined today by Preston Golson, a director in Brunswick Group's Washington, D.C. office. In addition to his work dealing with cybersecurity and technology crises, Preston helps lead the firm's work supporting companies in their efforts to be more resilient against disinformation. Preston and his colleagues at Brunswick have also been essential partners in our work here at CSIS to train judges and their teams on how to detect and proactively prepare for the challenge of disinformation that's targeting the courts. Before joining Brunswick, Preston served in a number of national security roles, including as an analyst at CIA and an aide to the first two directors of national intelligence. He also served as a CIA spokesperson, chief of CIA's public communication branch in its Office of Public Affairs, and chief of communications for the agency's Directorate of Digital Innovation. And last but definitely not least, we are joined by Ted McConnell, the executive director of the Campaign for the Civic Mission of Schools. He's been engaged in advocating for more and better civic learning for over 25 years. In his career, he has served in staff positions in all three branches of government. And currently, he serves as a consultant to the Annenberg Public Policy Center's Civic Mission of the Nation initiative and another key advisor to our Defending Democratic Institutions project at CSIS, someone uh, without whom we, we could not have embarked on this effort to promote civics education. So grateful to all of you for your work and thrilled that you're here to talk with us. Um, as a reminder to our audience, uh, hit the Ask Questions Live button to submit your questions. So, uh, so let's get started, and and maybe with uh, you know something, uh, uh, Madam President, that you touched on in your remarks 
and is clearly reflected in the way that you articulate this cornerstone issue for your term as president, which is civics, civility, and collaboration. Um, how uh, talk to us a little bit about how you see civics uh, and 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 uh, bringing civics conversations into the workplace, advancing that goal of civil discourse. Yes, thank you for that, Suzanne. So when I began to think about running for ABA president and what would be uh, the area where I wanted to focus, at the same time, I was getting a lot of questions from my non-lawyer friends. And for those of us who have friends who are not lawyers, they think that lawyers know the answer to everything. Like they think you're a constitutional lawyer. They think you're a criminal lawyer. If you say lawyer, they just bring everything to you. But what I realized is they were asking me questions that really underscored the need for civics and understanding the branches of government and how they work and how they're meant to be separate. And, and, and they really weren't understanding how that works. Uh, and, and so I began to think civics. And it also demonstrated to me that without the understanding of civics and that civic engagement, you start to have uh, people that are disenfranchised and they, when they are disenfranchised, it doesn't mean that that, that anger or that uh, mistrust goes nowhere. It just means that they don't have a way of expressing it. And we have got to give people not only the tools to understand what should be going on, but then understand what their role is and what they can then do when they find that uh, society is not functioning in the way that it should. What are some of the productive ways that we can take that knowledge and then be able to make a difference and to make changes? And so for me, they're, they're really two sides of, of, of an issue. There's the civic understanding and then there's the civility. And for, for lawyers in particular, because we do have codes of ethics and we are called to uh, conduct ourselves in a certain way. I think that we can lead in these conversations, but it is not exclusively our conversation. And that's why the collaboration is important. We need the journalists and business leaders and educators and faith leaders and national security uh, advisors. We need all of us coming together to be able to promote civics and civility if we are really going to see the kinds of changes and the impact that we would like to see. I think you're on mute, Suzanne. <laughs> I see you nodding, Ted. Uh, uh, Deborah, I said that was incredibly well put, and uh, and I know that it's music to Ted's ears because um, you know he again he's he's engaged now with Annenberg on this civic mission of the nation. Uh, so your com you know comments about the whole of nation approach being absolutely essential here. And and Ted has really been, uh, you know, such uh, really prodding us to to talk about advancing civic knowledge, civics knowledge and civic skills. Um, and uh, so, Ted, uh, you know, if you want to give you an opportunity to to from your perspective, how you see this relationship between uh, advancing uh, the knowledge of of our how our government is organized and the role of the individual and being able to promote this civil discourse, uh, for example, in the workplace. Civics, civility, civitas is how I formulate it. First and foremost, of course, thank you, Suzanne, for the opportunity of being here with this very distinguished panel and thank you Madam President, for your extraordinary advocacy for the civic mission of our nation's schools. It is much appreciated. It starts at home, of course, with parents who stress the value of civility and the vital necessity of civility. But in the educational sense, it is the province of civics classes and the social studies where we stress the importance of engaging in civil guided discussions of contemporary issues. And I'll say more about that in a minute, but I go back to civics, civility, civitas, they flow together 
with civics and civics knowledge being the key. So, Ginny, you you have been spearheading in many ways the very proactive work of Microsoft to uh, advance civic knowledge, but also those civic skills. Talk to us, you know, sort of with some specifics about how this, how you're doing this at Microsoft, and how you as a as a company see the relationship between advancing civic knowledge and 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 creating a more cohesive workplace. Sure. Well, just to echo again, thanks to CSIS and you particularly, Suzanne, for your leadership on this. And apologies for a scratchy sounding voice. I had a college reunion and children's sports over the weekend, which was a bad combination for my voice. Um, but Sounds as like we fun, do, though. It, it, a great weekend, yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, as we you know, as Microsoft approached this question of sort of what was our core civic responsibility as a corporate leader, um, one of the things that we thought a lot about was, of course, our employees um, and also our customers and sort of acknowledging that we have a way to influence and work with those groups um, to improve their civics literacy and their civility and those sorts of things. But then we started, to your point, getting into the specifics of what does that look like and how do we do it? Um, one of the first things that we did was pull together what we call an, inter an internal civic engagement hub for our employees. We found that we had a lot of employees who did not have easy access to things like how to be engaged in their own civic community. And with the proliferation of issues kind of raising up to the national level so quickly, we found that a lot of people were engaging on political issues, but not in a way where they could actually affect or see change in their real lives. So one of the things that we wanted to make easier for them to access and to act on on their own behalf was, how do you go to a school board meeting? Do you want to run for office? Here are some tools to consider how you might run for office. Here are some of your colleagues who have run for office. We do profiles of them to give them a sense of what's possible and what's out there. Um, really trying to re-energize this idea of like your own community is something you should value and, and spend time in and contribute to, which is really kind of the definition of being an active civic participant. That also brings us, though, to the idea of civility, because I think of civility uh, sort of as being an action of being an active uh, civic participant, right? In order, if you want the best for your community, whether that's your workplace or your neighborhood, you you know that you need to work with others. You know you need to be able to engage and hear each other out. Um, and so that's why we are also focusing on civic discourse. That's something we're moving towards in the next sort of half of the year is how can we encourage our employees to be civil to one another, even though we might be sitting in places of great disagreement, there are ways that we can, for lack of a better phrase, disagree without being disagreeable. Um, and we think there's real value in, in sort of being able to achieve that. Um, you know, one of the reasons why this is so important to us as a company, and we get this question a lot, is sort of why does Microsoft care about democracy so much? And why does Microsoft care so much about civics? You know, how does that play into sort of the corporate environment? And for us, it's fairly obvious. I, I'm sure you've heard us say before, Suzanne, many times how much democracy is good for our business. When we look at our revenue as a company, over 90% of it comes from the world's democracies. And so we as a company have value in, in working in democracies. Um, but there's also something to be said for having a better product and better products happen when you have colleagues and coworkers working together, sharing diverse perspectives and opinions. And so a civil discourse within the company really is only going to yield a better product for our customers in the end. Yeah, great. Terrific. Well, and you know, you're uh, the, you're not just you know saying uh, these words. You're you're putting your money where your mouth is, which is a real testament to to the reality uh, of of that statement. I think that um, speaks volumes. And and Preston, you must be having these kinds of conversations with the companies that you talk to. These are politically fraught times. Um, and CEOs are really challenged, right, to to find the right path and do the right thing, um, to be responsive to their workforces and 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 you know um, walk this line. So, how do you see civics uh, advancing some of those objectives? Some of the things that Ginny talked about are, are are those the kinds of conversations you're having about? democracy is good for business and business should be good for democracy. T tell us how you're having these conversations with CEOs and companies. 
Well, thank you, Suzanne. And thanks to all the people on the panel here. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. If I could take a second to talk about sort of the cross currents that CEOs are facing and you kind of wonder why is it's challenging and being in these rooms advising uh, companies, you can see the challenges they're faced with. And I see like three or four cross currents that they're facing. Uh, first being sort of this perception that you know, businesses are only engaged in civics for their own self-interest. This is kind of like too much money in politics. There's views there. Uh, there's also views that um, the opposite side, that businesses are too focused on doing good and that the, the, entire, the entire focus should be on the shareholder. This, so you see the sort of this um, anti-ESG sort of approach that's kind of come up in the last year or so. So that's another pressure people are feeling. Um, then there's kind of the polarization of everything. <laughs> so everything is viewed from a political lens. So you know, whether you're left or right, civics is viewed as indoctrination or some sort of like, you know, people try to put this, these bad spins on things that aren't really there, but that's perception that CEOs have to sort of deal with. Cause you're, you know, if you're, if you're running a large company, you're kind of, you know, you're, it's, it's a large town. So you have people of all different types of views and, and so forth that you're dealing with. And then there's just sort of the view of some people are just fatigued maybe, and they just maybe like, just want to go to work and not to worry about politics, right? So those, these are various things that people have to, uh, deal with and on top of that sort of running when do you speak out on issues you know how does it affect your your customers and so forth so there's a lot of cross currents that people are dealing with but at the end of the day I, I think um, that it's good for the current workers it's good for future workers civics is um, first of all existing companies you know I think people want to feel good about the companies they work in and they don't want to feel that their companies are, are providing um, they're providing positive influence in the community uh, many great organizations in America are tightly linked with the communities in which they originated. Um, so that's something that people want to see and their, their, their companies involved in making the community a better place. But that's for current workers, but also for future workers. We know the next generation is very much interested in working in places that, uh, that are as active in the community and so forth. So when you're looking about the war for talent and trying to bring the best talent to your organization, you know, having a strong civics program, a strong program where you're engaged in the community, is very, uh, very, very useful for, as, a, as a differentiator <laughs> as well for, for talent coming in. So there's a lot of like, there's a lot of challenges um, as with anything in the world, in, in our world today, um, but it's definitely worth the effort to try to navigate those currents. Yeah, and Preston, I, I wanna pick up a little bit on that too in the work that you and I've done together around disinformation, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, as you know, one of the things that has led me to join, uh, you know, Ted and Deborah. Uh, and Jenny and others late in the game to jump on the civics bandwagon, if you will, um, was you know my work in in trying to look at how we counter, how we understand and counter disinformation, um, and particularly from adversaries. Uh, and having looked at Russia's information operations designed to undermine trust in democracy and democratic institutions, including our justice system. Um, by convincing people that that they are irrevocably broken and the individual is powerless to bring about any change. Um, and, and I believe strongly that civics is the best antidote to the content of that kind of pernicious disinformation. But you, you've been very involved in our training for the judges and um, writing up the playbook. Do, you know, how, what are the most important things you see civics bringing in helping the business community wrestle with disinformation, which threatens them as well. Yeah, no, I'm putting my national security hat back on. I uh, actually wrote an article about a little bit of a year ago about called polarization at the water's edge and how like polarization and this uh, growing culture of contempt that uh, Harvard professor Arthur Brooks talks about that's grown in our country is a national security concern because it creates um, cleavages and differences in our country that uh, foreigners, foreign adversaries can exploit um, uh, to the detriment of, of our national security. Um, so yeah, no, I think it's it's a huge issue, and I think um, it's it's a uh, concerns me very much. <laughs> and uh, I think one thing that we talked about a lot uh, with our work on disinformation was making sure people understand the values of our civic court institutions, because ultimately, what these foreign adversaries are attacking is they're trying to tell you that the values of these institutions don't matter, that they're not you know they're not um, accountable, they're they're unfair, and we all know our institutions are not perfect. Uh, and there are things that are in our institutions that hold people accountable and we use the civic process to hold them accountable but ultimately at the day like can we make sure that american citizens understand the values of our organizations and our institutions and that while flawed they are um they are they are successful and 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 helping our society move forward um so i think that's something we've talked about a lot with the the, the national center for state courts is really making sure that we can, we can communicate those values and i think civics, civics does that uh it, the values of ultimately like having a, a society where people have different views, but come together and, and find solutions. 
And, and Suzanne, I do, I do have to leave now, but I just want to pick up on that point. And I think what we've seen in the ABA, we've been conducting uh, uh, surveys over the years. And in fact, our 2023 uh, Civics Liter Literacy Survey actually has some questions about civility in it this year. So it will be interesting to see what those results are. But the, the surveys previous years have indicated that there is uh, a decline in the confidence in some of our uh, legal systems, especially our courts. Uh, and that, as I, I don't have to tell any of you how dangerous that can be, because uh, again, when people don't have confidence in the courts, it doesn't mean that they don't have disputes that they need resolved. It means that they think of other ways of resolving it. And we don't want that. We want people to be able to have the confidence in our in our courts, whether it's the federal courts or our state courts. And and by the way, we're seeing that decline in confidence across the board. It's not just the federal courts. It's not just the Supreme Court, which has, of course, been in the news of late, but it's state and federal courts. So this really is, for me, a clarion call moment. We have got to make sure that we are promoting the civics, we are promoting civility, uh, and and I often talk about you know agree to disagree in some of my, my speeches, and it doesn't mean when we promote civility that we're saying you're less passionate about your views. It just means that you need to channel that passion and that energy into ways that are productive. So again, thank you all for what you're doing here to get that word out and what we're trying to do at the ABA. Uh, and I really appreciate this opportunity to have spent at least a, a small por portion of time with you. Well, we're so grateful. Uh, thank you so much and 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 good luck uh, with the rest of your term. and uh, and you know, you know you you've got uh, supporters here standing ready and willing to help uh, with this important issue that you have taken on. and thank you so much for it. Thank you all. Yeah, take care. Suzanne, if I can follow up with gratitude to Deborah for all that she's done for civics. You know, in addition to promoting civility, in addition to when it is taught, when there is time for it to be taught, to promoting an understanding of our institutions, good civic education, like we describe it in the Civic Mission of Schools reports, I'm reminded of so many studies that have been done, like most recently, the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation commissioned the Harvard Business School to do a study that showed, like so many studies before have, that effective civic learning, again, like we promote in the Civic Mission of Schools report, helps develop essential workplace soft skills like personal responsibility, the ability to work well with individuals of differing backgrounds, and yes, civility. You know, our, our proven practice number two in civic education is students should be afforded the opportunity to practice civility through guided discussions of current and controversial issues so they can practice agreeing or, or disagreeing agreeably, they can practice respectful dialogue. And by the way, it's never too late to learn how to engage in civil dialogue. Yeah, great. You know, and I think um, that is not the same uh, as debating. Uh, you know, I think a, a lot of high schools, you know, give students an opportunity to have debates. And I think that's great. Um, I do think you should have to argue, you should be encouraged to argue the side that is the opposite of what you actually believe. Um, that's a good exercise. Um, but I do think that it's that that debate kind of like elections sets up this idea of you either win or you lose. And that the and that the discussion is about convincing as opposed to the discussion being about listening and understanding. And I think that's uh, that's the sort of key skill that maybe doesn't get picked up otherwise. Ted, you wanted to respond to that. Yes, uh, Diana Hess and Paula McAvoy, two of our nation's stellar uh, uh, schools of education officials, 
have written a book called Controversial Classroom or Controversy in the Classroom. It shows how to do exactly what you were saying, Suzanne, develop the skills, not in a formal debate, give and take, but develop respectful dialogue. And that's what we mean in our proven practice number two in civic education. So is that the kind of thing, so as we focused on civics at work, as you know, we tried to do, we, we tried to think, we pulled together a round table. You guys were all part of those conversations where we brought in smart people like you to help us think through how do you translate these kinds of concepts that have been relatively well developed for the K through 12 environment into the workplace, into uh, community college? How do you develop this for adults? Um, and uh, and it's tricky because you have a limited amount of time, right? That's not what they're there for, uh, in theory. And 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 you're you know you again you're you're talking to adults. So Ginny, I know that you guys at Microsoft have given this a lot of thought. Um, how how do we translate these concepts in a in a way that is workable, viable, appealing to a workforce? Sure. Well, it's. Um... You know, people are people no matter where they are, but when they're at work, I think that there is a a sense of professionalism that we can actually leverage to further these conversations because people, particularly at Microsoft, I, I can't necessarily speak to other companies, though I'm sure this is the case elsewhere. Um, they value their jobs, they value their colleagues. Um, there's a sense of sort of good faith amongst one another, I think in many cases, and a shared mission. Um, quite literally, we all sort of sign up for the mission of the company um, and then the mission of our orgs and our and our groups and our teams. And so once you have that sort of thing that we all can agree on, we're working on trying to make that sort of the center of then how we have these conversations. Once you acknowledge the areas of agreement um, and identify sort of a shared interest, um, shared bond, shared mission, it's a, it's a lot harder to sort of hate the other person. Um, and so that's one helpful way that I think we can use the corporate environment to have these civil conversations. There's also sort of the reality as people enter into these kinds of discourses that they don't want to limit their career potential. And so I do think you have a bit of restraint that comes into these conversations because of that. I think what's challenging is you want to make sure there's restraint, but not that people feel like they're stifled from sharing. And I do know that that's something we will have to continue working towards, particularly in an environment where sort of the perception is that most people at a company that's West Coast tech based is going to have a single political perspective, which is, of course, not the case of as many employees as we have at Microsoft. In fact, we have we have employees around the world and across the country. So not everyone is a you know Silicon Valley Pacific Northwest type person. But you, you do have sort of a perception of that that you have to work with your colleagues on to understand that perceptions um, may not be reality and that people will come from a different political background. So I'm not suggesting we have it all worked out, but finding that area of, of shared agreement, shared mission um, with a little bit of a healthy uh, professionalism, I think is a way to create a dialogue that is actually going to move the ball forward. Yeah, I think that's such a great uh, insight, Jenny. And I would say that's one of the, I think, a, a potential difference between the kinds of things you can do in a K through 12 environment and the things you might want to focus on in a workplace. You might not necessarily want to focus on controversial conversations in the workplace. You might want to focus on discovering, as you say, those shared aspirations. I, you know, I used to talk a lot about how we need to rediscover our shared values. I think we need to back up. I think we're at a point in this country, sadly, where even Agreeing on shared values may be difficult, but at least shared aspirations. You know, how many people in this room think government should treat everyone fairly, regardless of how much money or how much power you have? You know, who's going to disagree with that? So you you can start off with some sense of, OK, we all agree on some basic shared aspirations. We may have strong disagreements about how well the government is living up to that aspiration. But let's start with those areas of agreement. And I love the emphasis on, on shared mission, because I do think, certainly in the government, but I think it's true in the private sector as well. People come to work, they want to do a good job. They'd like to leave at the end of the day thinking they have advanced whatever it is that they they see as their job. Um, so I think those are those are great, great places to focus on. Um, can I add to that, please? Yeah, yeah please do. Yeah, it, it's it's very exciting that you know uh, work is one of the places in the in the country where you don't get to self sort. I mean, 
there is some self sorting going on in terms of where people choose to work, but like you can choose your clubs, you can choose if you choose to worship, you can choose your places of worship, you can choose a lot of different things. But in the workplaces where you're oftentimes, you know, whether it be the factory floor or an office, you're sitting next to somebody who may have a completely different view of the world politically than you do, but you're trying to get to that shared goal, as, as Jenny mentioned. I remember my first job in high school working in a in a retirement home kitchen, like the, our goal every day was to get the kitchen closed and get in, get done on time, right? So <laughs> you know, people from all different walks of life, different backgrounds, we had a shared mission and uh, and you learn to sort of work, those are valuable lessons. You learn to work with people who have different views and you, you have your arguments every now and then, but at the end of the day, you try and get the job done, right? Um, so that's what the workplace sort of um, provides that sort of like uh, one of the places in America that's not as self-sorted as many of our social media and other things are. Um, so that's, that's a tremendous opportunity there for people to learn again to work together uh, in a way that's uh, the collaboration of the three the C's that were mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and we, you know, one of the things we did in addition to the sort of substantive guide on uh, civics for adults, where we talk about some of the key issues you'd want to convey, and Ted, I'll let you uh, speak to that a little bit in, in just a minute, because you do have limited time. It's important to prioritize what are the key aspects of of our the way our government our constitutional republic is set up that you'd want to make sure that all adults have a good sense of um and 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 then we make up a, we, we've got a, a guide for implementing civics at work that talks about some of the ways in which you can then convey those concepts in ways that are can be fun and team building uh for your workforce whether it's you know teams playing civics trivia from the from the uh, citizenship test, or um, or or looking at a community problem, you know, we talked. You talked earlier about you know focusing on those community issues. Jenny, you talked about that um, can be really important. Your local community, that's an area where the big sort of culture wars and controversial issues might uh, fall by the wayside. You're focused on getting that bridge on Clark Street repaired, right? Um, you can come together around that as a shared mission, for example. Um, but, but Ted, let's talk a little bit about some of the key concepts. Uh, Deborah Enix Ross touched a little bit on on some of those key concepts. But, but what do you think are some of the most important concepts, given the limited amount of time that you have with a workplace, that you think adults ought to have? Ted, you need to unmute. Yep. As I was saying. So certainly an understanding of the criticality of the rule of law and concepts similar that underlie our free enterprise system. Uh, an, a basic understanding, there are three branches of government. This is how they relate to each other. This is federalism. These are the powers reserved to the states. This is what the Bill of Rights means. Uh, these are concepts that that should have been taught K to 12, but for a variety of reasons, we for two generations in far too many schools in far too many places in this country, we have failed to effectively teach civics. So there are a network of innovative resources, and you, you mentioned a couple of fun fun ones a minute ago, Suzanne, uh, available that uh, have largely been developed for high school, but can be adapted, in many cases have already been adapted for use in adult settings. And, and one key thing is most of these resources have been developed for use in a classroom period, which is 50 minutes, which is like a lunch hour in a business setting. And they're available at the civicsrenewalnetwork.org. That's all one word, civicsrenewalnetwork.org, the brilliant brainchild of Kathleen Hall Jamison, the person behind factcheck.org at the Annenberg Public Policy Center, has brought together 40 plus of the nation's very top civic learning uh, resource providers, ranging from uh, Deborah's uh, American Bar Association, Public Education Division, the Khan Academy, National Archives, the Library of Congress, dozens of nonprofits like the National Constitution Center, the Reagan Presidential Library, the Edward Kennedy Institute, the Bill of Rights Institute, the Center for Civic Education, and iCivics. They're all available uh, 
they're, they're largely written, Bloom's Taxonomy, in adult understandable language and adult style, available at civicsrenewalnetwork.org. Start with Suzanne's Civics at Work Business Implementation Guide. It's absolutely brilliant. Suzanne wrote it with Davey Nair. That's going to give you the ideas to implement a program at work. And then there are the resources at civicsrenewal.org. Great. Um, and uh, Davey Nair, who was the, the co-author of that, and, and Bill Banks as well. But Davey can put maybe some, some of those links um, out for, for folks to see. Um, or you can find them at the web address that Ted has suggested um, and the civics guides that we did uh, under the auspices of APPC can be found at CSIS.org as well. Um, so, so what are some of the key considerations? Ginny, what are some of the things that we ought to be thinking about as if there's folks listening to this who think, you know, I might be interested in doing this um, in my environment with adults, whether it's a law firm um, or, 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 or a, a business or it might be a community college. Um, what are some of the things that that uh, that you've thought about in terms of the challenges and the potential barriers um, of getting people interested in this and to take advantage of the resources that you put that you all have created, the portals, et, et cetera? Well, I'll I'll start by outlining some of the challenges that I hear people bring up um, and that we've considered ourselves frankly, um, in some ways, it seems like this just verges on the political and we don't want to be political. And so we're going to stay out of it. And I'm sympathetic to that. And I understand that because companies don't want most companies don't want to be political. They see ca extreme cases where it can go wrong um, and they just don't want to be involved. I think for us, one realization we had was that there was really no no uh, standing on the side. There was no bystander in this. We were all kind of stakeholders in this because our future, and I don't mean to make it sound too dire, but frankly, our future does depend on it. Um, and I think we do see workplace impact of the lack of civics education in many ways. And I think we also can see how it impacts the communities around us when people aren't behaving in civil ways with one another. Um, and so there's there's no way to completely escape it. You cannot stand on the sidelines. It will impact your, your company and your employees and your business. So there's sort of the original acknowledgement that we are part of this ecosystem. And, and once you've sort of accepted that, that's stage one, um, then you start looking into, into what it means to engage. And this is where I would encourage companies to look at what makes them special because every company is different. They all have different things to bring to the table. How Microsoft engages in civic uh, civic work with our employees and customers might be vastly different than how, say, a local um, chain of restaurants might do it, or how um, a, a different type of company that maybe doesn't work in software or technology might engage. I would just encourage you to think about what is different and unique about you as a company, what you have to offer and how your employees engage and then who are your customers? You know, if you have brick and mortar stores, potentially there's a way to do something with your customers in person, in real life around civics issues that might resonate more. For us, that tends to be on our Bing homepage um, around voter registration deadlines, reminding people to go register to vote. That, that makes sense for Microsoft. We have reach. Um, we can tell roughly where people are regionally and encourage them to go register to vote in the U.S. Um, that's how we can engage. But again, if you're a brick and mortar, maybe that's some kind of um, voter registration engagement outside of your stores. Um, so it, just think of what you have to bring to this conversation. Look over some of the materials that have been created and, and think about where you fit into it. Um, and that would be where I'd start. And then I'd also just think about local community, not to keep harping on that. Again, I just talked about how we're a big global company and we have reach everywhere. Um, but in many ways, you know, a lot of our headquarters, our headquarters is based in the Seattle area and a lot of our employees are there. So also think about where is your headquarters? Where are most of your people? Are there ways that you can engage with your local chamber around something like this? I love what the Chamber of Commerce Foundation has been doing around the Civics Bee. I think that's such a creative idea. If you all haven't seen it, I encourage you to go take a look. It's a sort of a twist on Spelling Bee where, where students engage on civics uh, training essentially. So I, I would just look at your own communities and find ways to engage there as well. Yeah, and um, it's terrific. You know what, uh, as the um, 
the Civics at Work initiative that we launched uh, last year um, asks business leaders to uh, basically sign a pledge to and commit to doing three things. One is the first is to be an advocate for reinvigorating civics education in this country. Um, and that is, uh, you know, at all ages. And, um, you know, Ted, I think, touched on the fact that we failed to teach civics. Uh, you know, we had Sputnik um, October 4th, 1957. And suddenly there was this panic that we were behind on STEM education and that STEM education was a national security imperative. And what so many of us have been saying is um, we are now at a moment where, where we, we, we need to see this as our Sputnik moment for civics. Civics education is also a national security imperative. And the federal government spends on average $54 per student today on STEM education. And uh, on civics education, uh, we we used to say it was five cents per student until last year when Congress passed uh, legislation that appropriated, uh, Ted, correct me if I'm wrong, $23 million additional for civics education. Correct. Yeah. So um, it works out to roughly 42 cents per enrolled school child versus 54 per STEM. STEM is a Fifty-four dollars per STEM. STEM is a cent. Forty-two cents. Yeah. But we need to be concerned what what kind of citizens are doing the science and the technology. Well, that's exactly right. Um, and in fact, one of the things we've talked about is working to get some sense of civics and civic responsibility into our STEM training so that we are training uh, the next generation of engineers, innovators, scientists, technology folks um, with that sense of civic responsibility um, that comes with civics as well. So the first thing is to be advocates for reinvigorating civics. The second thing is to engage their own workforces in ways that build civic knowledge and civic skills. And then the third one to your point, Ginny, is that they commit to supporting civics activities in their communities. And that, as you say, there's a lot to be said for learning by teaching uh, and, and engaging. And so uh, getting your workforce engaged in supporting civics activities in their community is a great way uh, also to improve their civic knowledge and civic skills. If it's going and talking to the civics class at the high school, if it's you know uh, supporting the chamber's civics B activities all around the country, all kinds of things that uh, that can be done. And employers, interestingly enough, I learned this in one of our roundtables, employers are, um, uh, are one of the last remaining most trusted entities in this country. Decline in trust in all kinds of government institutions, um, but employers are, are among the still most trusted. And so, uh, again, a wonderful um, place uh, to, to get that um, knowledge and those skills. Um, we do have a couple questions from our audience. Uh, so here's the first question. Civics works best when it's engaging things people care about, when it links to bettering their lives. In the workplace, unionization is a central issue. What can you say about potentially controversial discussions like this in the workplace? Well, I'm, I'm happy to. Oh, Jenny, I'm happy to jump Jenny, in Jenny, yeah. at a high level um, and then turn it over to others to maybe get into details. Um, and and Suzanne, you already you already said like it's workplace is probably a good place to avoid really controversial things, but I wouldn't say something relative to working would be considered controversial. Um, and this is where it gets into a, a an area of the Microsoft world that I don't really represent, so I need to be careful what I say. But I do know that as a company, we've taken a stand to say that if people want to talk about that kind of thing, that's completely appropriate, and it's up to them to have those conversations, and they're welcome to do so. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think I think if we create this foundation of understanding of how to have civil conversations, then how that's chosen, you know, how they choose to engage it. It would be it's just going to be a better conversation that's going to yield a better result if they start from a foundation of understanding how to work together um, from a civil perspective. Yeah, great point. Preston, is this a concern that you encounter? You talked about the cross currents. Um, are the, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are CEOs out there who are concerned about their restive workforces, for example. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. It's a, um, I probably would, I'll say the unionization question because that's a different sort of business discussion. Um, because some you know different corporates have different views on that one. But in terms of just a general point, you know, um. A lot of CEOs do are, are concerned with what their employees think about issues and so forth. I mean, the idea about when to speak out about issues, especially as a growing diverse workforce and, you know, uh, people want to see that, you know, the company cares about issues that matter to their community. Think about issues like police, uh, you know, police issues and so forth and policing of African-American communities. You know, a lot of African-Americans are interested in that issue. You can think of any number of issues that people want to feel supported by their company on uh, and sort of understanding where your various employee research groups are on these things is very important. To, so that, that, you know, again, it's not necessarily an employee resource group, but a union is a employee resource group in some regard. Um, so just trying to have, how do you, do you have like feedback mechanisms and, and, and uh, ways of communicating with your workforce, you can understand what they care about, because um, that could be something that is, um, uh, you can show a lot of great leadership to your, to your employees by, by being uh, attuned to that. Or also conversely, if you're not attuned to that, that could cause additional challenges for you as a lead business leader. Yeah, and I think you know, Ginny said you you, you can you can hope to avoid uh, some of this uh, conversations or be a bystander, but but the reality is these conversations are going to be happening uh, in your workplace, and you can either take proactive steps to make them civil conversations and constructive conversations or you can you know sort of put your head in the sand and 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 pretend they're not happening or hope they go away i think that's part of the answer there um we have another question how can this is a really good question how can employees they're all good questions how can employees get involved in these efforts even if their employers are not interested in promoting civics and civil discourse activities at work and ted you probably have a answer to that Oh, golly, yeah, there are so many wonderful resources that have been create innovative resources created in recent years dealing with just the issue of civility and promoting civility in civil conversations, living room conversations started by Joan Blades, uh, uh, the National uh, Dialogue Project. Uh, again, I've uh, going to sound like a broken record here, but go to civicsrenewal.org and you'll find links to many organizations that have uh, not only civil dialogue programs that you as an individual can prove Bob Putnam's wrong that we don't bowl alone anymore, mm -hmm. but you can bring to your community. Here's one to go to, Citizen University citizenuniversity.org out of Seattle, started by Eric Liu. He's one of the Pied Pipers of civic engagement in this country. And he's got a lot of, Ginny, I like what you say about keeping it local. Local civic engagement programs, you can start in your community, like Civic Saturdays, which gets the community together, cross all the different barriers to talk about what's valuable in the community, Citizen University. There are some ideas. Right. So can, I add to, can I add to what uh, yeah, Ted said there too? Um, going back to the point about uh, employee resource groups, like most companies have them now. So you think, you know, that could be um, ethnic based or it could be like veterans, for example. So imagine if you are if you have a veterans group at your organization, you know, you could think about, well, what are the veteran issues in our community that need to be addressed? And how can we as veterans at this particular or organization come together and and say to our company saying, we as veterans believe that this issue is something that we should care about in our community. Can you support us? Because we want to sponsor this or we want to uh, do a community service event here or something like that. So I think that as the employee resource groups grow at different companies, those individual groups can be um, voices for um, specific projects that then sort of move their company into that space where they're thinking more about doing more civic engagement. I love that, Preston. And, and, you know, you can see that group, say that veterans group uh, through that employee resource uh, committee saying we want to tackle this issue and we want to learn how to bring local, state, potential federal resources to bear to, to tackle this. We want to bring in our local city council person um, to talk at, the, at, at our next town hall about the, what they do at, at City Hall and what 
what role they can play in addressing these issues. And we want to bring in a state legislator and right. So so learning around a common issue that you actually care about, I think, was the thrust of the question and uh, earlier. And, and I think it is it's it's a it's a very powerful way to learn. Um, so here's a really interesting question. It may be our last question. Um, I'm just going to read it as it was presented to us. Social norms don't sustain themselves without quote unquote enforcement. Social sanction when they're violated. What ideas do you have for helping the people sanction actors, political, social, organizational, that don't follow norms of civility? So you can you can challenge the premise uh, of the question um, or you can, you know, Talk about how do we reinforce, uh, you know, how, if, if civil discourse is a norm we want to encourage, how do we reinforce that norm? If you're not as comfortable with how do we sanction those who? I, I think you lead, by, you lead by example. I mean, I, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I'm a big believer in there's free will and then, you know, trying to force people to do something like cause them to dig in further. Um, so I think you lead by example. You know, you have to show people the positive effects of, of this of, of civil discourse and you need to do that more and more i think the people who we've been too quiet about the positive effects of civil discourse and in that quiet we've allowed other other voices to sort of take the take the initiative so uh, and you're not going to sanction them sanction people back to, to to where you want to be you got to show them the, the right way of doing things and show them the positive side of things and bring people over it's one it's, it's an english english language is very interesting that like a word like compromise has two different definitions to it if you look at it one definition is that you know a mutual agreement, and the other definition is that you're you're you know settling for less, right? I think a lot of our conversations have turned compromise into that second definition, where people feel that it's giving up something to go to to uh, to compromise. And I think we need to sort of view the first definition of it, which is that it's reaching a mutual agreement on things. So how do you just help people encourage people to know that you know it's not has to be winner take all punishment and so forth? No, there's actually a positive way forward on these things, and I think it's done by leading by example. Boy, I, Preston hit the nail so on the head. That starts with leadership at all levels. Counseling, uh, calling out, we've seen it doesn't really work and, and it causes a bit of a backlash. But insisting upon civil norms of behavior through leadership, at all levels of business, at all levels of society, is the least we can ask for. And Jenny, keep it local. <laughs> well, the other thing I was going to add to this is kind of another dimension of the question, which is at the at the source of of the demand for this. Meaning, this comes up a lot in disinformation, which is essentially, do you do you stop disinformation by stopping it at the source, or do you stop it by stopping it at the demand? What is it that causes people to want this sort of information. So why would people continue to engage with those who are not acting civilly? You know what I mean? Because in theory, the sanction should come from their constituents, should come from their viewers, you know, whichever, however we're talking about it. But if that's not doing it on its own, if that's not accomplishing it, it means there's something broken um, elsewhere that make, makes people want to be around, engage in, vote for, listen to those who are who are behaving in a way that's not civil. And so I would think about that challenge. And I think the answer is local. I'm just kidding. I, uh, I think there are a lot of ways to sort of get at the answer of that. But I do, I do think part of it is really that root question of why are the people not enforcing this themselves? It starts in your local school where we failed for two generations to get these basic civic concepts across. Uh, so that's where you, you keep it local. But we ask, we beg on behalf of the American people business, model Microsoft, model Southern, model the incredible leadership of CSIS and Suzanne Spalding and the American Bar Association and pick up where our schools have failed and provide the basic civic knowledge and basic civic skills so that our young people don't fall for the foreign interference and misinformation so dangerous to our republic. 
Well said, Ted. And and I think also, Jenny, I, it's such a great point. Ranting feels good sometimes. You know, it feels really good to have that righteous anger and to be really upset. And so this is why this emotional stuff carries so much farther on social media, right? It's so much more popular. Um, but I do think that part of the reason that we reach for that uh, way of feeling good is because we have not, as Ted said, been taught how to be effective agents of change. It feels better, I I would argue, to actually be able to bring about change in that thing that you're really upset about than it does to simply yell about the thing you're upset about. But if you don't think you can bring about that change, then you have to settle for just yelling and feeling good because you're emoting and you're at least expressing your anger and frustration. So. This is, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, uh, the way in which I see civics contributing to civil discourse and a and a and a better path forward for our nation, is is empowering individuals to be more effective agents of change, so that they can reach for that, rather than just that emotional um, response. I love that. That yeah. was great. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good. So we will. We will we will uh, end the panel discussion there, but I would encourage uh, folks to stay on because we've got an inspiring video. It's just seven minutes um, uh, with highlights from um, national security leaders and civics leaders uh, talking about why they think that uh, civics is a national security imperative. If you can't stay on to watch it now, you can find it at CS. IS.org, but we're going to play this video now and then I will come back on uh, to wrap it up. But I want to thank. As a national security leader and as an educator, I've had a first hand, you know, up close opportunity to see how important civics is. Do you agree that it's a that it is really a vital to our national security? I think it's imperative and, and frankly, I think that the level of public discourse, ugly nature of uh, the public debate today, the divisiveness in our country, uh, in my view, are a reflection uh, in at least some part of the absence of civics education. When you see a lot of polling about Americans declining trust in institutions. You know, the military has been one of the institutions that's been most highly regarded. And I think to the extent that we see a little bit of a, a decline there in trust, it's around Americans' concern about the politicization of military leaders. And part of, I think, why that's happening is because we are, we are in such a hyper-partisan environment and we are, you know, um, so divided in many ways that I think, again, you know, we really need to find ways to, you know, to rebuild the center. And I think civics and an emphasis on civil discourse um, would help us do that. As a public servant and as an African-American who's lived 63 years now, in my, my experience, any great movement for social change needs to have within it as a centerpiece civic engagement. Uh, and I'm reminded of something that President Reagan said in his farewell address when he spoke about the need for what he called an informed patriotism, one that's grounded in thoughtfulness and knowledge. And that strikes me as a pretty good shorthand for what civic education should do, uh, create informed patriots who know our history and actually understand how our democratic institutions work. Over the last several decades, civic education in American schools has seen a significant decline. The event of January 6th highlighted the consequences of this neglect towards civic education. And it can be seen in our current state of divisive politics and a lack of knowledge and an understanding of democratic principles, norms and institutions. A robust investment in civic education is needed now more than ever, as a continued deficiency in these values 
presents a national security crisis. Democracy is a beautiful experience. It is an experiment. It is not a finite thing that happens to you. Um, and we need to uh, impress upon everyone that we need people to participate in that system. But we also need to do the work to address the disparities within the system so that when we send empowered people in, that system is ready for them to engage. Frankly, it all boils down to if it doesn't work for any part of us, it doesn't work for any of us. So we really do have, and we see this now, I think, in what the coronavirus and certainly the protests on police violence have revealed, and that is that there's a huge set of issues, structural issues, we're going to have to address and develop new approaches, and that means civic engagement, and that's got to have a civic education preparation. I know all of us go out and do speeches, and I know Every single time I will always end up with, I do what I did so you can do what you do because our nation needs you to do what you do. And, and the importance of, of, of that civic duty uh, of whatever you wanna do to participate in this very messy democracy, but to create that more perfect union. I mean, we're recruiting 18 and 19 year olds into the military. And so if they don't understand um, our system of government, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we take an oath to, we swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, if they don't understand what that means, and the next clause, against all enemies, both foreign and domestic, you know, they they have to they have to understand what our what the Constitution does, that it creates our structure of government, it creates our system of government, and what our role as the military is in that, and it's to defend that. We're, we're not. Um, beholden or um, loyal to a person or even a position, um, but it's to the Constitution of the United States. It starts at the local level. It starts in the elementary schools and the junior high schools and the high schools and the, the towns and the villages. And watching this democratic process work is what will make us all better citizens if we not only watch it, but engage in it. Uh, and frankly, it will make our national security that much stronger because we will have an educated population, an educated citizenry that cares about national security and will point us in the right direction. What is true at Microsoft is true across the tech sector and is true for higher education and even high school writ large. We all need to spend a little more time understanding a broader range of fields but let's always recognize that at the end of the day, the heart of our society is our democratic foundation, and therefore civics education always has to be at the heart of this multidisciplinary approach. We can't find ourselves in a position for very long where our citizens start to distrust the institutions of government and the people that run them. It is our obligation as business leaders to not only work with our employees, but to work with the communities we're privileged to serve to help solve these problems and to create a form for understanding. If we don't care about living in a democracy, if we don't tend to the garden of democracy and, and the conditions that make it right, it's not an automatic thing. It's imperfect. We don't have endless resources, but we can't make our union a more perfect union unless people are actively participating. And so like Justice Gorsuch, I believe that that's the purpose of civic education, not merely to teach the structure of the three branches of government and who's on the Supreme Court. Those are facts. And some of them, like who's on the Supreme Court, change over time. But I do want people to understand what the purpose is of our democracy and what the purpose is of our three branches of government. Because if you know what it's about, you can make changes. I hope you were as inspired by these leaders as I have been over these last few years that I've had the honor to interview them as part of our strategic dialogue on civics as a national security imperative. As I discussed earlier, our nation realized after the launch of Sputnik in October of 1957 that improving STEM education was a national security imperative. And our message is 
that reinvigorating civics education and civil discourse is an equally vital national security imperative. And business leaders can play a key role, helping to build the civic knowledge and civic skills upon which our constitutional republic depends, while at the same time fostering a more cohesive and inclusive workplace. I want to thank you very much for joining us and for more information on our Civics at Work initiative and our other civics work, go to CSIS.org. Thank you so much. Thank you.